Dimitri Smoking from the University of uh, Pierre Mercury, and he will be talking about the churn character of the Felinda bundle. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> So the main character of this talk is the Verlinde bundle, also called the bundle of conformal blocks. It is based on a paper with Alina Marion, Drago Chopria, Rahul Pandaripand, and Aaron Pixton. Since this is a short talk, I'm try I'll try to be as down to earth as possible. So here is the setup. There is a famous vector bundle, and we decided to compute its churn character. So that's fairly simple. This is the vector bundle. The, where is there a pointer? This is the, let me see, yeah, okay. <clears throat> right, so the base of this vector bundle, mg and bar, is the space of stable curves of genus G with n marked points, and then the bundle itself, Oh, oh, there should be, this should be muse, actually. There will be muse in the, in the rest of the slide, sorry. So the, these, these things here are representations of a, uh, of a Lie group. Now I'll, I'll introduce the vector bundle itself a little bit later. Yes, so from, from now on, they are muse, as you see. Okay, and this vector bundle has a churn character that is an element of the cohomology ring of, uh, of MGN bar, of the base. So this scheme uh, also represents the plan of the talk. I will first say a couple of words about the moduli space of stable curves. Uh, then I will uh, introduce, uh, well, then I will, I will have to, before we can compute the churn character, we have to introduce, maybe not describe completely this cohomology ring, it is still unknown, but at least introduce some generators in terms of which the answer can be expressed. So the second part will be about the cohomology of moduli spaces. Then I will introduce the Verlinde bundle itself, and finally present the answer and uh, hopefully give the idea of the proof. All that in 22 minutes. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this picture represents the moduli space of stable curves, mg and bar. It is a smooth complex orbifold of dimension 3g minus 3 plus n. And over the moduli space lives the universal curve cg and bar. So over every space, uh, every point of the moduli space, let's take a generic point, P, like here. So over a generic point, you can see a Riemann surface, a smooth curve of genus G, in this case I took genus 2, with n marked points, in this case three marked points. Here's another generic point, that's another smooth, smooth curve. And then inside MGN bar, uh, there is a normal crossing divisor. So what you see here is a, is a divisor with normal crossings like the walls and the floor of this, of this room. And if you take a point on one of the components of the divisor, uh, you get a stable, so over this point lies a stable curve. Uh, that means a curve with a simple self-intersection, a node, in this case, we have a separating node, so the curve is separated into two irreducible components. Then there is another component of the boundary divisor. If you take a point here, you get a curve with a non-separating node. And then you can take deeper strata, so the intersection loci. If you take a point in the intersection, you get two nodes, one non-separating and one separating. Here you have a self-intersection of the component of non-separating nodes. So you have two non-separating nodes. And if my picture had more dimensions, I could have gone into deeper strata still. 
Okay, so one remark is that these, the components, actually every stratum of the boundary is a, a product of smaller moduli spaces. So if you look at this one with the, the divisor of, with the separating node, what you see here are two stable curves of genus one, one with three marked points, so two are marked and the other one is the node. And here you see also a genus one curve with one marked point and one node. So this component is isomorphic to the product of M13 bar and M12 bar. And if you look at the component with a non-separating node, what you see here is a genus one curve with five, five marked points, two of which are identified to form the node. So that's M15 bar. Actually divided by a group Z over 2Z, but I, I will skip some details. OK, so now I will define several line bundles over the moduli space, over MG and bar. Uh, so there is one line bundle per marked point. In this case, I chose the second marked point, and I take the cotangent line to the curves, to, to the fibers of this universal curve, at the second marked point. Every green line, green complex line you see here is the cotangent line. And you see there is a one green complex line over each point of the moduli space. So that forms a line bundle L2. Uh, and officially, so if you take the relative cotangent line bundle to the fibers, you take S2, which is the, sec the section of the universal curve that corresponds to the second marked point. So L2 is the pullback of the relative cotangent line bundle uh, by the, under the second section. And you can, do with, you can do that with any marked point, so you get N line bundles L1, Ln. Then there is another a vector bundle this time that is called the Hodge bundle. Um, so that's a vector bundle of Frank G. And if you take a point P in the moduli space, the, bund the fiber EP is the space of holomorphic differentials on this Riemann surface. So this is a genus G Riemann surface. There are exactly there is a g-dimensional space of uh, holomorphic one forms on it. Uh, so the sections of this uh, relative cotangent line bundle, global sections. And if you put them all together, that forms a vector bundle that I cannot draw as, as before because it's rank g. But, okay, that's, a <coughs> that's called the Hodge vector bundle. OK, now, as you see where we went from the moduli space to the cohomology classes. So now, to every line bundle, I can assign its first churn class. It is called psi i. So li is the cotangent-like bundle at the ith marking, and psi i is its first churn class. So these are two cohomology classes. And similarly, for the Hodge bundle, well, the Hodge bundle has many churn classes, but we are only going to use the first one, so I denote it by lambda. It's the first churn class of the Hodge bundle. And again, so the Hodge bundle, the fibers of the Hodge bundles are the spaces of holomorphic one forms on the curves. So these are some cohomology classes, and there are also natural cohomology classes that are formed, that are Poincare dual to the boundary strata. Since there are all these boundary strata, the Poincare dual, well, there are Poincare dual cohomology classes. And just an example that we will use later. So if we take the Verlinde bundle and restrict it to the open part MGN, so the space of smooth curves, um, its first churn class was computed in a previous paper by three of the four co-authors. So there are some coefficients. So the, it's a linear combination of these psi classes and the, and the class lambda. And the coefficients uh, are called w and s minus c over 2. So I will introduce these numbers later just to give you an example. So <clears throat> these classes psi i and lambda actually span the, the second cohomology of MGN. 
So we know that the first joint class of any vector bundle is a linear combination. All we have to do is find the coefficients. And these coefficients were already known. OK, so now let's go back to the description of uh, the cohomology ring. Now there is, so there are the boundary strata, there's this, these psi classes, and now we can combine the two. So this is a picture that represents a combination. So this, this graph that is called a stable graph, it represents a boundary stratum. So if you choose a complex structure on each of these small Riemann surfaces, and then you glue them together by contracting the edges, and you put the marked points where these legs are attached to the, to the surfaces. Right here you have a leg that you can contract to obtain marked points one and three. This leg you can contract to obtain marked point number two. <clears throat> so this is one boundary stratum in the moduli space of curves, and it is a product of three smaller moduli spaces, as I explained. So here you see a curve of genus three with four marked points. Here you have a genus zero with four, five marked points, genus one with two marked points. And on each of these smaller moduli spaces, you have its own psi classes. So here you have the psi class called psi three. Here you have, for example, a psi class that is assigned to this marked point that has no name. So in the next slide, I, oh sorry, this is a, this is not, uh, so this is the map from the product of these three moduli spaces to the big moduli space of stable curves of genus six with three marked points. So here are one, two, three marked points. And the genus is six because if you add three, one, and zero, that gives you four. And you also have two independent cycles in this graph that gives you an extra, extra two. So if you glue these three surfaces, three curves together, you get a stable curve of genus six. And in this slide, I labeled all half edges, all the half edges of the graph, so that now, for example, in this space, M34 bar, it's a genus three surface with uh, four marked points, and now they are labeled, so instead of being numbered one, two, three, four, now they are labeled one, three, alpha, and beta. Okay, and this picture represents the push forward of the product of psi classes that are, so there is a psi class on every edge. So for example, in this M34 bar, we take psi three and psi beta squared. And on this M12 bar, we take the class psi delta. And on this M04 bar, we take the class psi two. And then we take the push forward of this product under the map J. And there is a normalization factor. We divide by the number of automorphisms of this graph. In this case, it's two. The only automorphism of this graph reverts the orientation of this edge. So now I remove all the necessary labels. In general, the answer, so the answer to the problem, the churn the churn uh, character of the Verlinde bundle will be expressed with pictures like that. Every picture like that represents like a homology class in MGN bar. So maybe just a remark on this. So psi three, for example, is a churn class that is <coughs> defined globally all the, on the, all, all of this space M63 bar. Whereas psi beta, for example, is defined only on this boundary stratum. If I smooth out this node, it's no longer defined. But that's, that's OK. That I can still take the product of these classes on this boundary stratum. OK, so now we <coughs> come to the definition of the Verlinde bundle. And the first thing is we have to choose a simply algebra C over C, sorry, simply algebra G. And this is its uh, system of weights. So this is the weights, this is the positive vial chamber. These dots are the positive weights. For instance, if we take the Lie algebra to be SLN, each black dot corresponds to a Young diagram with n minus one rows, at most n minus one rows. 
So there is one thing that we will use. It's the conjugate representation. So if you take a representation of this Lie algebra, there is a conjugate representation <coughs> that you can see in the, in the wild chamber. Or here is, the, again, the example for SLN. Here is mu. Here is the conjugate of mu upside down. You will have to turn it by 180 degrees to get the actual Young diagram. And we have to choose a level. So here you see level 0, level 1, level 2, level 3. I decided to choose level 2. Yeah, <coughs> also the example. So for SLM, the level is the uh, height of the, of the Young diagram. So if you take level 2, that means you are taking Young diagrams with <coughs> at most two rows. Right? So you will have boxed. Young diagrams with at most n minus one columns and at most l rows. Okay, and here we have a finite set of representations of weight l. So these mu's here, the very in the bundle depends on n representations of g of level l. So each of these mu i's will be selected from this set of weight L representations of the Lie algebra. So there are two interpretations for this, uh, for this level, <coughs> level L. One interpretation is that you take the Lie algebra of uh, Laurent series with coefficients in G. You take its central extension and you try to construct a representation on which G itself acts as a V mu. So V mu is a representation of G, and then you try to extend it into a representation of the central exten extension of G of Z in such a way that the central elements acts by L <coughs> in this representation. And so there is a way to do it only if you pick a representation from this set. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And another interpretation that is more in the line of what I'm going to say is that if you take the conjugacy class of the element exponential of mu of mu in the uh, in the sorry yeah <coughs> in the in the Lie group it's probably mu over l sorry it <coughs> probably should be mu over l so on every on every uh, so on this, uh, on this orbit, on this, on this conjugacy class, there's a symplectic form, and we would like L times the symplectic form to be an integer, because later we will <coughs> try to, con we will construct a line bundle such that L times omega is, a <coughs> is its first turn class. <coughs> okay, so now there is a moduli space that I'm going to describe in general on the right, and in the particular case, g equals u of 1 on the left. So this is the simplest example that is, to be honest, not exactly a particular case, because u of 1 is not a simple Lie group. It has a, so in general, it's S, SLN. Here I, j I just, well, I take <coughs> u of 1 instead. So in the simplest example, you just take a Riemann surface. In general, you take a Riemann surface with n marked points. Okay, and here you have the space of, so you take the trivial uh, U1 bundle, just your surface times U1, and you look at the space of flat connections uh, on, this, uh, on this bundle. So a flat connection is described by its 2G monodrome is around the cycle. So if you take the cycles in C, there are 2G cycles. To each cycle, you assign its monodromy. So you get 2G monodromies. So this space here is a torus, is a U of 1, this circle to the power 2G. So that's a 2G dimensional torus. Right? And, I, and this is actually isomorphic to the Jacobian of the curve. And you know that the Jacobian of the curve is not just a real torus, it also has a complex structure. That is called the Hitchin-Kobayashi correspondence. So the same thing. Where the same thing 
happens here. In this case, you can take the trivial principal G bundle. You fix the monodromy is at each point xi to be the exponentials of these mu i's that are fixed here. And you get a certain moduli space that's, so th th this description, you can describe it easily with monodromy as you take two G elements of this group G, and then you take elements in this conjugacy classes for each marked points. There is a, <coughs> you, can <coughs> you can describe this space, but then the space happens to have a complex structure. Okay, and then on the, over the Jacobian, there is a natural line bundle whose first turn class is the theta divisor. And similarly, on this space, there is a natural line bundle that actually uh, uh, spans the Picard group, whose, uh, uh, so on this space, there is a natural symplectic structure, and uh, the first turn class of L is equal to the, to this, uh, to the symplectic form. And then in this example, you take the sections so of powers of this line bundle. Uh, these are theta functions of weight L. And similarly, on this moduli space, you take the space of global sections of powers of this line bundle, L power of this line bundle. This is called the space of conformal blocks, and this is the, so these spaces form the Verlinde bundle. So for each Riemann surface, you have this vector space, a space of sections of some line bundle on this moduli space M, moduli space of flat connections. And if you take them all together over all Riemann surfaces, all, all, all stable curves, you get the Verlinde bundle. And there is one last remark. So in this case, the rank of the, if you take the space of uh, theta functions of weight L, the, the, its dimension is L to the power G. And in this case, if you want to find the rank of this line bundle, of this vector bundle, sorry, it's given by the Verlinde formula. So there is a formula, it's a, well, a well <coughs> famous formula that gives the rank of this bundle that I will not write down, but that will actually be used in the, in the answer for its churn character. Okay, <coughs> so now I start to formulate the answer. Okay, so uh, this is the killing form on the, on the Lie algebra G, normalized in such a way that the longer root is, uh, has length square root of two. There is the element rho that appears in all of well, in the representation theory that's half of the sum of the positive roots. There is a thing that is called the dual Coxeter number. So if you represent the highest short root on the basis of simple roots, you sum the coefficients and you add one. If you take the longer roots that call just the Coxeter number, this is the dual Coxeter number. Okay, there is this C um, that will appear in the answer that is called the conformal anomaly, since there are a lot of physicists I think I should use as many physical terms as possible, even when I don't know what they mean. <laughs> okay. And there is this Ws, so to each representation mu, level L representation, we assign a number like that. So again, to be a little bit more concrete, let me show you the, what all these are for SLN. So the half sum of positive roots is just a staircase Young diagram, n minus one, n minus two, and so on up to one. Uh, the dual Coxeter number is just n. So C is given by this simple formula, and squared minus, minus one is the dimension of SLN. And W of mu, so if mu is the, is the Young diagram, the partition like that, the Young diagram given by a partition like that, there is, a, again, a formula that gives you W of mu. <clears throat> okay, so one last definition before I give you the answer. If you have a stable graph, a decoration assigns a level L representation 
to every half edge. So here is the graph. On the, on the legs, you actually already have level L representations given by these mu i's. But now to every other half edge, I also assign at random uh, a level L representation in such a way that the two representations on the two half edges that form an edge are conjugate to each other. Okay, then we take this graph and we assign, so it's similar to what uh, Rahul actually described in the previous talk. So there is a product of three factors. So to each vertex, we assign the rank given by the Verlinde formula. You see here, you have the small moduli space. It has its own Verlinde bundle with these four representations. This Verlinde bundle has a rank given by the Verlinde formula. So we will remember this. Now for each leg, you write e to the power w of mu i psi i. So psi is the psi class that we introduced. And for every edge, we have a somewhat more complicated factor. Again, with this w of mu and uh, the two psi classes on the edge. So on each edge, there are two psi classes. This is a <coughs> power series in psi prime and psi double prime. The numerator is divisible by the denominator. And one remark here is w of mu. Mu is one of these two representations. And lucky us, w of two conjugate representations are the same. So it doesn't matter which one we take. OK, and here's the final answer. So the churn character is equal to e to the power minus c over 2 lambda. So c is the coefficient that I introduced. Maybe let me backtrack. C is here, this coefficient. And then it's the sum over all stable graphs with all possible decorations where you put the rank on each vertex, the edge factor on each edge, and the leg factor on each leg. And then you multiply them all. That gives some powers of psi classes. You add them all up, and you obtain the churn character. So now, do I have one, one minute? OK, that's a, OK, very good. So in this case, let me, <laughs> let me, so these are some references. What was known before? The answer in genus 0 was known before. And the first churn class was known before. And then there are, OK, so I think, uh, I think I'll, yeah. OK. <clears throat> so this, this vector bundle is projectively flat. So we know that the churn character is equal to its rank times e to the slope. And we also know the first, and we also know the first, uh, the first, churn, uh, the first churn class. So the idea of the proof in 30 seconds. <laughs> so th these. Uh, this, these, churn these churn characters form a semi-simple cohomological field theories, and any semi-simple cohomological field theory is obtained by is obtained by given Tal's R matrix action on the so Verlinde algebra that gives the rank of the vector bundle. So we have the rank, and we need to find the R matrix. <coughs> uh, and okay, and to find the R matrix, we use this uh, flatness, the projective flatness, and the knowledge of C1. So the projective flatness implies that the R matrix that is usually a power series in Z is just the exponential of one small matrix. And the knowledge of C1 determines this man, one matrix R. It's actually a diagonal matrix with entries W. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> In case of uh, SLN, is your answer equ equivalent to the ground prism theory of uh, for Grassmannian? Well, no, I don't. No, 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 no. <coughs> so, okay. So there is indeed a connection between the algebras. The right, the the. So if you take the Verlinde algebra, 
uh, yeah, there's a connection between the algebras of the, <coughs> the, yeah, the Frobenius algebras for the Grassmanni and the, and the Verlinde algebra, but it does not extend to the whole Frobenius manifold. So it's, uh, <coughs> so it's, the so answer what, is no. What, what, so what, how do you, so what do you have to modify, what, what do you do to the Grassmannian to, to reproduce your answer? Is there a way to modify it? Well, I don't, I don't know, because actually... Is there, is there a way to model your cohomological field theory on some... Uh, sigma, so the cohomological field theory is not the same. The cohomological field theory of the Grassmannian and this one are different. I understand, but yeah. so, is, so is there other you know, manifold, maybe virtual manifold, which will produce your answer? Which will be, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. So the, <coughs> the connection is not, is not clear. Yeah. There's a question here, yeah, in the first row. So does the fact that the R matrix is an entire function of, of Z, so in the formula you wrote, or also in the talk of Raoul, there was this formula where the edge weight was something like that, it was exponential of something. Does that have any meaning uh, from your perspective? <coughs> so, so, so can, can you the fact that the R matrix is an entire function of Z. Oh, entire, yeah. It's very uncommon. I mean, it's just exponential. It's even much simpler here. Yes. Well, I don't know if, uh, <coughs> in principle, the R matrix is just a formal power series in Z. Yes, indeed. Sometimes it has analytic properties. So in this case, the in this case, this is just related to the to the flatness. So you, if you know the, if you know the first churn class on on the open part of MGN, you know all churn classes on, again on the open part, and this knowledge on the open part is enough to determine the whole, the whole R matrix. But I, yeah. More questions? Any more questions? What language is Yes. Unfortunately, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I was not expecting this question yet. <laughs> Next time I'll prepare better. <laughs> yeah. I was actually wondering too, but not enough to. Yeah. Sorry. I don't <laughs> I don't see any more questions, so coffee time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>